Good morning. morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name as we come to worship our Lord and Savior today, and we're excited about our time of worship. Also, our Sunday school children are going to sing for us this morning, so we're excited about that as well. We're glad that you're here today. We are a Christian community called to worship and sent to serve, welcoming all to walk with Christ and to grow in faith. And worship being one of those uh, pillars of our uh, statement of faith here, one of the most important things that we do here, well, we're glad that you're here and a part of that. But we're also doing this together, and this is an important thing to recognize that we are the body of Christ together. So let's begin our worship service by standing and greeting each other this morning. Today we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the rivers clap their hands. The Lord has made made known his salvation. You may be seated as we join in singing our first hymn. Continuing on with our confession and absolution. God's word tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silent reflection. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our scripture readings. The New Testament reading for today is found in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. In the Old Testament, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by, the lo- by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments, his statutes, and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, 
that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is found in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 9. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, and you are not of the flesh, and you, are, and you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul's servants through whom you believe as the Lord assigned to each? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading for today is from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a, a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it, is, it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simple, yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we'd like to invite forward our Sunday school children to sing their song. <laughs>
Great job, children. Why don't you just hang around right up here because we're going to do our children's message. You guys did a great job this morning singing. And any others that want to come forward for a children's message? Excellent. Okay, today I'm going to read a story to you. It's called The Good Man. Okay. Jesus told this story one day. There was a man who was on his way to visit a town that was far away. But out of the bushes jumped some thieves. They didn't say thank you. They didn't say please. They took his things and knocked him down and left him bleeding on the ground. Uh, not very nice. Not long after, a priest came by. He saw the man and heard him cry. Did the priest help? Did he even try? No, he did not. He walked on by. So the priest didn't even help this guy. He was just hurt by those thieves. Next came a Levite. He saw the man too. He, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I'd rather not bother with that kind of guy so he stepped to one side and walked on by. So look, even someone else just walked on by. He didn't want to be bothered by that. At last a Samaritan came that way. He saw the man and decided to stay. He bandaged his wounds and gave him a ride. He fed him some food and stayed by his side. So look, that man, he took care of him and he took care of his wounds, gave him some food, Let's see what else he's going to do. And when the Samaritan went on his way, he counted his coins and paid for their stay. So they went someplace to stay. Then Jesus asked, who did the good deed? Now go and do the same for someone in need. So in that story, we heard about someone who got hurt and people that kind of walked on by because they didn't want to be bothered, but one person actually helped. Do you think that was what Jesus was inviting them to do? That if someone was hurt, if someone was sad, that they would come and take care of them? Yeah, and we can do that too as well. And that's, Jesus says it's always important for us in doing the right thing. It has to be with people, that we want to take care of people and care for them. So let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing love to us, even when we were hurt and injured and sinful, that you came to us and helped us. Lord, help us to help others who are in need and to know and trust that you are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys may go back to your seats now. And we'll continue with our next song.
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts gathered here today be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wow, it was hard for me to say the gospel of the Lord after our reading today. Jesus talked about the law in all of its strictness. In fact, what he was doing is actually making the law harder for us. In the sense that he said, like, you shall not murder. And people said, well, I haven't murdered. But he said, if you even hate your brother, you've broken that commandment. Or let your yes be yes and your no be no, not all these other oaths and other things. And he just goes on and on here with talking about how difficult the law is. So how can we say that this is the gospel of our Lord when it just sounds like the law? Well, today we want to kind of see maybe the bigger picture, that we're just getting a little slice of Jesus' ministry here and talking about the law, but to kind of see the whole picture of what God intends with his law. But first, what I want to do is talk about something called house rules. I mean, how many of you have house rules in your house, whether written down or maybe not even written down? So I, I like this one here. It says, you know, these are good house rules to have. Say please and thank you. Yeah, that's a good thing to have. I like this one too. No fighting, biting, scratching, or spitting. I hope you don't do that in your house. No shouting indoors, you know, indoor voice. I always remember that, indoor voice. No hateful words. That's a good one to remember because sometimes that's hard and times more angry. Listen and respond. You know, when someone's talking to you, you listen and respond to them. Uh, take turns to talk. You always know that one who kind of talks all the time and never get a turn for that. And then the last one there. Remember, we love each other. That's a good set. But, you know, with uh, kind of the advent of Airbnbs, you know, people renting out their homes, a lot of times they have to put a list of rules in those homes. And so this is kind of comes out of that. So I like this one. If you break it, fix it. If you open it, close it. If you turn it on, turn it off. If you unlock it, lock it. If you break it, fix it. If you open it, close it. See, if you forget that, keep doing that again. And then it keeps on going. Turn it off, lock it, clean it, put it back. Those are good house rules too. But you really can sum it up this way. My house, my rules. I know I've used that one a couple times. My house, my rules. Or, this is probably one of my favorite ones, house rules. Number one, mom's the boss. Number two, see rule number one. How true that is. But house rules is maybe a good way of kind of framing what Jesus is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount in the sense he's laying out the house rules. These are our rules for living our life. But oftentimes when we think about rules, we think about that kind of that, that legal side of the rules. If you follow this, then this. You know, I mean, when you're obeying the commands of going down streets, you know, in our community here, when the speed says 40, that's what you need to do. And if you break that rule, there are consequences for that. So we oftentimes think of house rules in kind of that legal idea. And then that's what it really sounds like here when Jesus is talking about these rules that based on the Ten Commandments here and other rules that are there, that he's, he's talking about this legal idea. In fact, Jesus even said before in, in Matthew 5, 17, just earlier in this, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. So he's not saying that we're going to do away with the law and the prophets. So what is Jesus doing with the law here. And especially if we consider that, well, Jesus' life almost seems like a little bit of a contradiction to these rules. And I think that's where maybe the Pharisees and others really had trouble with Jesus. You know, Jesus, who is laying out this sermon, this is early on in Matthew here, he's laying out what God's law is, in fact, making it more difficult, and I'm sure there were some legal experts who were kind of like clapping for Jesus in the sense of, yeah, you know, raise that up, do that. That's, that's how our community needs to work and to function that way. <laughs> but then, Jesus in his ministry, well, where does he go? You know, a little bit later on in his ministry, he calls Matthew to be a disciple for him. But remember, Matthew is a tax collector. And in that culture, that time, a tax collector, because he was collecting taxes for Rome, which was the occupying force, well, that was considered betrayal. 
why would Jesus welcome in a tax collector who is obviously breaking all the laws of God here? He's not following God's commands, and yet he brings him in to be a disciple. And not only that, he goes to his home, and, and now the Pharisees are saying, he's eating with sinners. Why would Jesus do that? He just laid out here in the Sermon on the Mount that, you know, you've got to raise the bar when it comes to God's laws. You've got to raise the bar in the sense that it is very difficult. In fact, if you don't come away from listening to that, the Sermon on the Mount, especially that section there with some guilt inside you, then you, you're not really listening to what Jesus is saying because we've all broken these commands. In fact, some commentators even talk about that these commands here, the way Jesus was talking about it, is that people were finding ways around them. Especially when you see the one about divorce, he says, you, you say in your own laws you have a certificate of divorce is totally okay. And Jesus says, no. Or, I haven't really actually physically murdered somebody, but, you know, if I say I hate someone, Jesus just raises the bar there again. So what is he doing with this law? He raises the bar of the law, but yet when he's walking around doing his ministry, it seems like he's welcoming in the sinners. Is that, is that a contradiction in what's going on here? Is he breaking these house rules? Is he, he making these rules not something to follow? He just talks about them, but yet do we actually follow after them? Well, again, Jesus also said, he continued that verse there, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So at first blush, then, okay. Jesus comes to fulfill them. He, he, he lives the perfect life, but again, why is he hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? The law is working on our hearts and minds, and, and oftentimes it, it feels like that, well, God's just out to get us. I mean, to follow God's law seems an, like an impossibility, and that is one way that the law works on our hearts and minds. Like I said, if you, if you read these, you're going to feel some guilt in what Jesus is saying because we have broken these commandments. In fact, we've broken all of God's commandments. And it brings us to a point of recognizing that we are sinners. But that's not where the law wants to end for us. But yet we kind of leave ourselves there often. In fact, we, we do that not only in our own lives, seeing the things that we haven't done well and, and thinking, you know, coming up with ways that we can make the law in a way that we can do it better, you know, make ourselves look better. But, but we do it also when we kind of judge other people. I mean, we think of the law. We think of the, the things that are good and right, and we point to people who aren't doing the things that are good and right. And that hasn't changed. I mean, the Pharisees were doing the same thing, pointing to the sinners that Jesus was spending time with. And we're so good sometimes on seeing the law that way. But the law actually has a bigger purpose than just putting the boundaries on, so to speak, or telling us what to do and not to do. The law actually has a purpose to establish, maybe like house rules do, to establish a relationship with each other. You notice that the laws that Jesus were talking about require actually a relationship. They weren't just dealing with our inner lives, though that's part of it, but they were dealing with how we deal with other people, whether in our actual actions or even in our thoughts. You know, the murder one wasn't just about physical murder, but it was how we interact with people. Do we hate them in our thoughts and in our actions? The lust one, the same idea there. Are we, were we honoring marriage or are we just treating other people as just sexual objects? And so it's about a relationship idea. How do we view other people? How do we respect other people? And that's what Jesus is actually getting at, is our relationship with God. You see, see these laws are not just to beat us down and to show us all the wrong that we've done, but it's also to give us a glimpse of something better, something greater. I like some of these words from a uh, person who had preached on this sermon, as, or this uh, text as well, preached a sermon on this. So I want to just read them for you because they just, they, they just worded them so well. But this is the way that we need to think about God's 
law. Not only, yes, that we are sinners, but there's something even bigger here. First, we don't need to try to justify our behavior. I mean, with the law in front of us, we try to do that. I mean, how often do we want to say, yes, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, maybe not perfect, but I'm doing okay. But it says we don't even need to justify our behavior with the law, even though it feels like that. Because God has justified us by faith in Christ. God has justified us. So, so we don't need to, to stop, you know, justify ourselves and what we do. We can stop that. Because it's not about building ourselves up. It's about seeing what God has done for us. Or we don't need to explain away what we have done. Oh, how often have we done that? Oh, it was just a mistake or, you know, uh, I'm learning from that and, and we want to explain things away. No, we can sit in front of that law and see the fullness of it and how harsh it may be. Because by the suffering and death of his son, God has wiped away all that we have done. We don't need to explain it away. Jesus forgives it. It is bad. It is sin. We have broken it. But God has forgiven it in Christ Jesus. And so now we stand before Jesus and one another forgiven and free. And the law then is a picture of what the true kingdom is like. And how it's going to work out. You know, sometimes we, we're so caught up in the letter of the law and making sure that we do things right or, or make sure that other people are doing things right that we forget that what it's supposed to do is guide our relationships. How we respect each other. How we love each other. How we care for each other. As God has cared for us. And yes, sin has messed it all up. We cannot fulfill God's law. And he lays that out so that we see that clearly. But it's not laid out there to just put us into judgment and that's it. It's laid out actually to be a glimmer of hope of seeing something better on the horizon. Something better because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Yes, it awakens that sin in us. And we recognize that. But it should also awaken in us the desire, the opportunity... And even the looking forward to how we are supposed to live our lives. How we are supposed to live together with each other. And that's what Jesus was giving examples of in his life. When people are wondering, is Jesus abolishing the law? And he says, no. Were they wondering why Jesus is hanging out with sinners? It's because he was showing the example of what it means to be in a right relationship with God and with each other. Not condoning the sin, not explaining it away, not, not, not justifying anything. We are sinners in need of God's grace. But we're not left as sinners. God wants a right relationship with us and a right relationship with each other. And by God's grace and power through the Holy Spirit, we start to live that life here on this side of eternity, but look forward to it even greater in eternal life where God is restoring all things. And so may we live a life that, yes, recognizes the severity of sin, recognizes the law as Jesus clearly laid it out, but also recognize God's forgiveness, God's grace that makes us better people. Better people because of Jesus, better people that live out a life of relationship. They are house rules because it is a family together and a family that wants to share the love of Jesus. And so may we share that love with everyone that we come in contact with, just as Jesus shares his love with us. Amen. We continue now with the gathering of our offering.
I invite you to stand as we continue with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, the seas roar and the rivers clap their hands because you come to judge the earth. Receive our thanks that you declare us righteous by water and the word, and grant that we would live in that baptismal grace until you come in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you make us your children in baptism and desire that we grow and mature in the faith. Bless pastors, teachers, parents, and all who teach your word, and give us a constant desire to hear and obey it. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you condemn unrighteous anger, even as you command, you shall not murder. You have poured out your righteous anger on your Son at the cross, that we might be reconciled to you. When there is division, move us to repent and seek reconciliation with one another, so that we might live in peace. Lord, in your mercy. God of life. You condemn sexual impure thoughts, even as you command, you shall not commit adultery. Deliver us from lustful thoughts and defend us from the temptations of pornography, that we may lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, the author of truth, you command us, you shall not swear falsely. Give us faith to acknowledge your word and by your strength do what you command. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, you judge the peoples in righteousness and equity. Give wisdom to our nation's authorities. Preserve us from unjust division and cause us to love one another. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, our God, you are our life and our length of days. Sustain and strengthen those who suffer sickness and affliction. Especially do we remember Donna and Betty, Karen and Ruth, John and Wayne and Bill, Estella and Dennis, for Joe and Roxanne, for Mark and Joanne, for Kim and April and Sue, for Jeff and Sharon, for Janet and Matthew, for Joyce and Profe Maria, for Jessica and for Gail. And comfort all who mourn with the promise of everlasting life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, you give growth to the church by your holy word and sacraments. Preserve your people from the false wisdom of the world, which creates division and follows after the winds of the age. Unite the church in a common confession of your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we're glad that you worshiped with us today, whether you're joining us here or joining us online. We continue in our ministry of worship here, both on Sundays and also on Wednesdays. And so that is an important ministry here for us. Also, if you have prayer requests, if you have spiritual needs, if there are other things going on in your life, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Again, we work together as the body of Christ, and there are multiple ways you can reach out to us, and we uh, also reach out to you. Um, every Friday, we have our um, email newsletter that goes out. If you're not receiving that, you can go to our website or contact us at the office. And in that, it will be information about what's coming up, different events, different things going on here in the church as well. And you can check that out as our, at our website as well. Thank you, too, for the gifts that you give. It's amazing how God truly sustains each and every one of us. And in times of plenty and in times of want, God is always there for us. And so we thank you that you use those gifts. You give of your gifts so that we can further the kingdom here together. 
that we can be part of the body of Christ. Lent is coming very quickly upon us. On February 22nd is Ash Wednesday, and so that'll be the beginning of our Lenten journey. This year, our theme is going to be Amazing Grace, not only based on the hymn of, that's uh, celebrating its 250th anniversary this year, but the amazing grace that God shows to us and to his people. And we're going to look at different characters in the Bible and how God has showed his grace to them as well. Another piece of that is also these uh, Lenten uh, devotion books. And so we have uh, the, the general one on amazing grace that you can pick up in the back. That's uh, good for um, older uh, children and families, but we do also have some for younger children and families. Um, these will also actually also be going out to our school families, so we're going to share that with them as well uh, for the season of uh, Lent. And there's a daily devotion in each of these, um, very short, but a neat way for families to kind of uh, focus in on what God is doing for us. So you may pick uh, some of those up that are in the back for us. Also, coming up next two Sundays... Uh, we're going to be showing this movie called Life Mark. Uh, Bruce Sutherland will be kind of leading the discussion on that. Uh, Life Mark is a movie about adoption and about relationships. And so there's some powerful themes in there and, and some a little bit more adult themes. So it is a PG-13 type of movie, but uh, just recognize that going into it. But it's not anything that you have to really worry about. It's just more kind of adult type of themes. But that's going to be in the room that we normally do our adult Bible study, but it'll be next Sunday and the Sunday after that, so you can see parts of the film and have discussion together. But to give you a little idea of what the film is all about, I'd like to show you the trailer of this film. Are you okay with people knowing that you're adopted? Yes, mostly. Not really. Do you remember asking to see that when you were about eight years old? How old were they? I think she was 18 and he was 17. I honestly had no idea that this many people were wanting to adopt. Imagine how scared she must have been. She was pregnant when she graduated, and then the decision to place you for adoption. God, if you're there, please protect him and watch over him. There's a birth mother on the line with a question for you. It must have been the hardest decision of her entire life. Hello? But she loved you, and I'm so glad that she made the choice that she did. I've always wondered if my biological parents think about me. Today is David's 18th birthday. You want to talk to him? I don't think he'd want to talk to me. There's only one way to find out. I guess maybe I didn't want to feel different. You didn't want to be me. No, I didn't want to be different. Different. Okay, good. That's a lot better. God gave you to me and Mom as a gift. And you will always be our son. Is that your birth mom? She wants to meet. Really? Yeah. This is huge! Hey, what's up, Emily? <laughs> they have more than that, too. But anyways, I think it's a very powerful, and it's a true story, actually, as well. So, um, so the next week and the week after, we'll be showing parts of the movie and having discussion on that. And then after that, coming up March 5th, we're going to have a Bible study just for five weeks on the foundations of faith. Those are our basic tenets of faith, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, our sacraments, those type of things. So that will also meet in the same adult uh, classroom as well. But um, you're welcome to that. It's a great way to, to refresh the things, uh, learn some new things about it as well. And so you're welcome to that. Again, we are a Christian community called to worship and sent to serve, welcoming all to walk with Christ and to grow in faith. Any other announcements in regards to our life together we need to share this morning? If not, then we are going to sing our final hymn together and then also enjoy a time of fellowship uh, with each other with uh, the goodies and the coffee that is there. But again, we thank you for worshiping. I invite you to stand as we sing our final song together. <laughs> 